Well, Shabbat Shalom, everyone. I want to welcome you once again to Four Winds Church Online Teaching Ministry. I'm honored that you decided to take some time today and spend it with me as we study God's Word together. And so let's pray together before we even get started. And then I've got a little bit of introduction to give you as to what we're going to be doing. Pretty excited about it and uh, how it's even related to last week's study as we ended up the book of Luke together. So let's pray together, okay? Heavenly Father, we love you very much. We're grateful for your grace and mercy. Lord, I pray that you would cause your word to come to life for us today and that it would change us from the inside out and that, God, we would be encouraged, enlightened, um, strengthened in our faith. We would live our lives in such a way that it would bring glory and honor to your name. And that, Lord, if there's anyone watching today that's just struggling with their faith in any way, Lord, I pray that you would encourage them and you would reveal yourself to them in strength and power. Bring grace and mercy and salvation to us. Uh, bring your son, Yeshua, whose name means salvation. So Lord, we love you and we pray all this in Yeshua's name. Amen. Once again, God bless you. Thank you for joining with me today. <clears throat> if you remember and you were with us last week, we finished our study in the book of Luke. And as we were finishing it, we were looking at this topic of Yeshua explaining from all of the scriptures, the Torah, the writings, the prophets, the Psalms, how it was all pointing to him. And the two disciples on the road to Emmaus, they literally said, did not our hearts burn within us as he was explaining the scriptures to us. Then it also said that he opened their eyes, opened their minds to be able to understand these incredible truths from the scriptures. And then I said, we should not be foolish of heart and so slow to trust all that the prophets spoke about the Messiah, which is what Yeshua said. <clears throat> so in light of that, we need to be studying what the Old Testament says about our Savior, which is what we're gonna do over this next year. I'm actually one week behind from what the Jewish people do, which is read portions of the scripture and they march through these five books of the Bible in a one year plan. That means it's big chunks of the scriptures. I cannot cover it verse by verse, word by word, which is hard for me. I'm an ex expositorily preaching uh, preacher. Uh, I, I approach it from an expository view uh, where our approach where we march through the scriptures verse by verse, reading them in context and discussing what it means. I think that is extremely important and vital to properly understand your Bible. Uh, so in doing it this way, I'm going to have to take chunks. I'm going to have to take it a little bit thematic in each section, and I'm going to have to trust that you will dive into your Bible as well and read the full portions. So today we're picking up with the story of Noah. Last week, <clears throat> was, which was the week right after the Feast of Tabernacles, the cycle begins again. And they, the cycle started with the first section in the book of Genesis up through uh, chapter 6, verse 9. <clears throat> so, or verse 8. Today, this week starts with chapter 6, verse 9, all the way through chapter 11, verse 32. That is a lot of information. But I believe I can help us, or I believe God is helping us see what he's talking about in this section thematically, which is extremely important so that you can properly understand your Bible. And this is two stories in your Bible that are huge in understanding the rest of your Bible. Uh, so we're going to look at this story about Noah. And then there's a few other passages we're going to look at in Isaiah 54, also in Matthew 24, 1 Peter chapter 3, and Hebrews chapter 11. So <clears throat> we'll, we'll look at those, uh, but I want to just uh, give you some of that background on what we're going to be doing, and I hope that you will be excited about it. And I hope you'll join us throughout this next year. Be very, very uh, enlightening and just fun to do. I'm really, really looking forward to it. So we're going to pick up in <clears throat> Genesis chapter 6, verse 9, but to in order to understand that, 
to do it in context, you have to understand what was being talked about just prior. And that starts in Genesis 6, verse 1, but there's also something else of vital importance, just for a little bit of background, in Genesis chapter 5. So in Genesis chapter 5, and I hope you're taking notes. Uh, I don't have them uh, available for you to look at. But at Genesis chapter 5, verse 29. So get out a pen and paper and jot some of these down. Genesis 5, verse 29 says, this is when Noah is born, but pay attention to the details. This is cool. So it says, and called his name Noah, saying, okay, so get past his, oh, he named him Noah. Why did he name him Noah? This one does comfort us concerning our work and with the toil of our hands because of the ground which Yahovah has cursed. Wow. So Noah is born and he's given this name and that we're told that his name was Noah because they were looking for him to give them rest and comfort concerning the curse that God had placed on the ground. So a little more background here. <clears throat> Adam lived into 900 plus years he dies, and 126 years later, Noah is born. So 126 years passes between the time that Adam dies and Noah is born. By the time Noah is born, they're still looking for relief, and they're looking for some kind of sign or something from God, not necessarily a messenger, but maybe, because it says, this one's going to bring us comfort concerning the toil that we're having to work because the ground has been cursed by God. So <clears throat> here's what's interesting. Noah's name, the name of Noah means the one who rests. So they gave him this name and that's their hopes that they are going to find rest. Therefore, Noah would bring rest. Now that is important to understand. Why? Because of the full context of your Bible and everything that's going to come to light throughout the rest of our studies and how it attaches to the to Yeshua, our Savior. So <clears throat> to understand this about Noah bringing rest and what they were dealing with during that time, because the world had become exceedingly wicked. So to understand this story about the flood, you have to understand, well, why did God do this? He tells us that they were exceedingly wicked when we pick up here in Genesis 6, verse 9. But if you don't read those first eight verses, it sounds like, well, God decided mankind is just, they're just mean and evil and nasty, so I'm going to kill them all. Well, that's not entirely correct. It's a lot more detailed and a lot more sinister than that. So the context, or for a contextual note, the story of the flood is directly connected to the story of the Nephilim. And that's one of these things that you don't hear a lot of pastors talk about because they think it's just too weird, but then it is in your Bible. Sorry, I just did something silly. There we go. So let's read this in Genesis 6, verse 4. It says, The Nephilim were on the earth in those days and also afterward. So during the days of Noah and during this time, the Nephilim were on the earth during that day and afterward. Whenever the sons of God came to the daughters of men and gave birth to them, those were the mighty men of old, the men of renown. So when you're reading that in the English, it says they were men of renown. So what does that mean? Well, they were mighty men. And some people believe, and I think it's highly true, that's where the story of the Titans and Greek mythology came from. It's actually rooted in a truth that you had these hybrids of these, if you will, demigods that were born, and they were basically infecting humanity with their teachings and their DNA. But watch this. The word renown that you have there in your English Bible, <clears throat> it, 
even in the Tree of Life versions, one I like to read. Uh, I like to read that one, and the other one's just called the Scriptures. Uh, but the Tree of Life version for me is just a little bit easier to read, but I like some things about it, but I like some other things in the Scriptures version. Doesn't really matter. Just read your Bible. Whatever version you have, read your Bible. But <clears throat> you read that word renown, and you go, okay, well, they're, I don't know, special, smart, mighty, tall, giants. I would say yes to pretty much all of that. But the word renown in the Hebrew means something else than just that. What it means is they were men of the name. Hold on to that one. They were men of the name. Then in the last story in this whole large section here is the story of the Tower of Babel. And the people were of one language. <clears throat> and they built a tower and the top of it was up into the heavens. They weren't after just building a tall tower. You have to read all the details. Keep reading, in other words, and pay attention to the details. It says whose top is in the heavens. Does that just mean it reached the clouds? Or that the top of it was designed to get them into the heavens, or watch this, into the heavenly realm. I believe, when, when we'll see this here in just a second, that what they were trying to do was they're trying to get back to the days of the Nephilim. You have the flood, and then you have the story of the Tower of Babel, and then you have the declaration of God scattering them and him selecting Abraham as his inheritance and he's going to build a nation out of him. So the people were of one language. <clears throat> they built a tower with a top in the heavens. But then you have to see what their goal was. Their goal was to build, watch this, a name for themselves so that they would not be scattered over the face of the earth. Their desire was that they would stay unified they would continue with this, some kind of technology they had. There were Nephilim on the earth during the time of the flood and something happened where they were back on the earth again after the flood. Does that mean one of them survived or some of them survived or did they commit the sin again and intermingled with women? We don't know, but we do know that the giants were in the land even when Israel is trying to conquer the land. And those are the clans that God said, wipe them all out. He didn't just choose people randomly. They were all connected back to this tainted DNA with the Nephilim. So <clears throat> they were gonna build a name for themselves and they're trying to get back to the days of the Nephilim outside of God's plan. And then God declares, Watch this, that they would become successful if he didn't stop and intervene. He says, there's nothing impossible for them to do. In other words, they're gonna, they're gonna succeed in this if I don't stop them. And so what does he do? He confuses their language so that they stop listening to each other. They stop doing the work and then they are what? Scattered over the surface of the earth. So what they feared actually came true. Now, all of that is a background to understanding this whole flood story with Noah and how it connects to Yeshua. So <clears throat> this is where in uh, Genesis 6, uh, verse 13, it says, God said to Noah, the end of all flesh has come before me for the earth is filled with violence through them and see, I'm going to destroy them from the earth. Then he tells them, make yourself an ark of gopher wood, make rooms in the ark and cover it inside and out with tar. So once again, this great corruption of the people during the days of Noah are tied to the Nephilim and what they were doing. It's not that they just hated each other and they were killing each other and they were involved in all kinds of sexual sins and bestiality and all kinds of weirdness. Was all that happening? Yes. Is that why God killed everybody and wiped them off the face of the earth? No, it's because of the tainted DNA that was 
involved with the Nephilim and the technology that the Watchers and the Nephilim were teaching mankind. And it says that through them, it has corrupted, corrupted mankind. In other words, not only just with evil, but literally corrupted the DNA within us that's literally got the marker of God on us, making us his imagers on this earth. Therefore, just to be human is to be an imager of Elohim or Yahovah, the one true Elohim. So then in verses 17 through 22, he says, and see, I myself am bringing floodwaters on the earth to destroy all flesh in which is beneath, uh, which is the breath of life from under the heavens. All that is on the earth is to die and I shall establish my covenant with you and you shall come into the ark, you and your sons and your wife and your sons' wives with you and all the living creatures of all flesh, two of each are to bring them into the ark, keep them alive with you, male and female. And he goes on, you know, describing all that. And it says, and then Noah did all that Elohim commanded him. And so he did it. Now watch this, because when you keep reading into the next chapter, chapter seven, verses one and two, it says, and Yahweh said to Noah, come into the ark, you and your, all your household, because I have seen that you are righteous before me in this generation. <clears throat> I believe two things. One, Noah was doing what God said. Number two, I believe evidently and obviously he didn't have tainted DNA. Now, his DNA was still pure and intact. There was not any kind of hybrid inbreeding within him. And so he says, I have seen that you're right, that you are righteous before me in this generation that is so evil. And then he says something rather interesting. He says, of all the clean beasts, take with you seven pairs. You thought he only took two each of each kind, didn't you? No, the clean, he took in seven pairs, male and, male and his female. And it says, and of the beasts who, that are unclean, two, a male and his female. Can I ask you a simple question? The Torah hasn't been given yet. How does Noah know what is an unclean or a clean animal if God hadn't already told him? Evidently, God told him and he knew. He knew that these animals are clean and these are unclean. You're to bring in seven pairs of the clean kind and two of the unclean. We don't have time to chase all the reasoning behind all that. The, the simple fact, he said, bring in seven pairs of clean animals and one pair of unclean animals. The question is, how does he know which ones are clean and unclean? Because Moses hadn't written the Torah yet. Hadn't written the Torah yet. He's not, he hasn't been born. Moses hadn't been born. I mean, Moses hadn't been born. Abraham hasn't been born. There aren't any Jews yet. And there's a lot of people that say, well, Gentiles should only follow the Noahide laws. If you ever see that on the internet, can I tell you to just go ahead and just forget it because the Noahide laws is nothing more than a construct made up by the rabbis to try to keep Gentiles at a distance from what they believe is their Jewish culture and their Jewish laws. We're told in the Bible that there's one set of laws for everybody, the natural born citizen of Israel and the sojourner that has been grafted into Israel that is journeying with them. There's one law for all. Noah isn't a Jew, and God tells him, bring in the unclean and the clean, but bring them in in different amounts. <clears throat> so then we get down to Genesis chapter 9, and we see here where it says that God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, Be, uh, bear fruit and increase and fill the earth. And then he goes in verse 3 and says, Every moving creature that lives is food for you. I have given you all as I gave the green plants. So up until this time, man wasn't supposed to eat animals. We were vegetarians. Then he says, in the same way I gave you the green plants to eat, now I'm allowing you to eat meat. And then he says, but do not eat the flesh with its, with its life, its blood, meaning don't eat the blood. 
He's not talking about eating meat that's rare or medium rare, pink. He's not telling you you have to burn it, turn it into a cracker. He's saying don't eat and drink the blood. Drain the blood out and then you can eat it. And then he goes on and says, for whoever sheds man's uh, blood, by man his blood is shed, for in the image of Elohim he has been made. The reason this is so strict is because we were made in his image. And then he says, my covenant's going to be with you uh, and everything, and there's going to be fear of you among the animals. God literally puts that within them, uh, keeps this uh, distance, if you will, between the two. Why? That might be connected to the bestiality that was going on. A lot of weird stuff was happening. And he says, and this is going to be a sign of the covenant which I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for all generations to come. I shall set my rainbow in the cloud and it shall be this, uh, for the sign of the covenant between me and the earth. It has been hijacked and stolen like Satan has done with everything else that's good and godly. Uh, it has nothing to do with sexuality. It has to do with God's covenant on how the earth is going to be treated. In Genesis 11 is where you have the story of the, uh, the Tower of Babel, and I've already kind of explained that. I need to jump ahead now, and let's look at the story of Noah and why it's important for us to understand this as it's related to everything else in your Bible, quite honestly. In Exodus 12, verse 49, is where you see that there is one Torah for the native born and for the stranger who sojourns among you. That's Exodus 12, 49. There's a lot more, but that's good for now. Uh, <clears throat> Numbers 15, 15 is another one where it says that this is true, and it's true throughout your generations. But this is what I want to zero in on, which is in Isaiah 54. Isaiah 54, verses 1 through 17. Watch this. This is amazing. This is where God is proving he is faithful to the people of Israel and he connects it to the story of Noah. God said he would not destroy the earth by water and proof that he's not going to do it that way again is the rainbow that he's going to put in the cloud so that when it rains, like it's been doing here, and the sun is shining right, you can see this rainbow. It's the sun going through the water vapors in the air. <clears throat> And watch what God says in Isaiah 54 to his children of Israel. He says, Sing, O barren one, you who did not bear, break forth into singing and cry aloud. You have, have not been in labor, for the children of the deserted one are more than the children of the married woman, said Yahweh. Enlarge the place of your tent and let them stretch out your curtains of your dwelling. Spare not, lengthen your cords and strengthen your stakes. For you shall break forth to the right and to the left and your seed inherit the nations and make the deserted cities inhabited. These are the people that are currently under God's judgment. Verse four, do not fear for you shall not be put to shame nor hurt. You shall not be humiliated for the shame of your youth. You shall forget. Oh my goodness. Can we get an amen from somebody on that one? and not remember the reproach of your widowhood anymore. For your maker is your husband, Yahovah of hosts is his name, and the set apart one of Israel is your redeemer. He is called the Elohim, God of all the earth. For Yahovah has called you like a woman forsaken and grieved in spirit, like a wife of the youth when you were refused, declares Elohim. For a little while I have forsaken you, but with great compassion I shall gather you. In an overflow of my wrath, I hid my face from you for a moment, but with everlasting kindness, I shall have compassion on you, said Yahweh, your Redeemer. Who else is our Redeemer? Yeshua. <clears throat> Watch this, verse nine. For this is the waters of Noah to me. He's relating this to this promise he's making to the people of Israel. <clears throat> in that I have sworn that the waters of Noah would never again cover the earth, so I have sworn not to be wroth or angry with you, nor to rebuke you. This is why Paul said, is God through with the Jew? Far from it. I'm a Jew of the tribe of Benjamin. He goes on and on and on talking about that. 
Read your Bible again in context, Romans 9, 10, and 11. Look at this. Verse 10, for though the mountains be removed and the hills be shaken, my kindness will, is not removed from you, nor is my covenant of peace shaken, said Yahweh, who has compassion over you. What's happening during the time of Noah? Mountains are shaking, continents are moving, waters are raging, there's a storm, tempest. But God says, in the middle of all that, I am faithful. Who was he faithful to, to bring through that tempest? Noah and his family. O oh, you afflicted one, tossed with storm and not comforted. See, I am setting your stones in enmity. I shall lay your foundations with sapphires and shall make your battlements rubies and your gates crystal and all your walls of precious stones and all your children taught by Yahweh and the peace of your children, great. Even though you're in the midst of the storm, man, I'm gonna rebuild your cities like nothing you've ever seen. In righteousness you shall be established far from oppression, for you shall not fear, and far from ruin, ruin, for it does not come near you. See, they shall indeed assemble, but not because of me. Whoever shall assemble against you falls for your sake. It's going to build us up, and our enemies will fall because of us, because of God's promise towards us and us being in his kingdom. It's amazing. See, he says, I myself have created the blacksmith who blows the coals in the fire, who brings forth an instrument for his work. And I have created the water, the, the waster to destroy. No, this is one you hear quoted in, this, in the Christian churches all the time. No weapon formed against you shall prosper. And every tongue which raises against you in judgment, you shall prove wrong. This is the inheritance of the servants of Yahweh and their righteousness from me, declares Yahweh. Isn't that good news? Oh my goodness. He's saying, in the same way I made this promise to Noah, I'm making it to my people Israel. And we've been grafted in. But then listen to what Yeshua says, because Yeshua says in Matthew 24, go read it, verses 36 through 51, but watch this. He says, but concerning that day or the hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father knows. Watch this, verse 37. For as were the days of Noah, so will be, come, be the coming of the Son of Man. For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage until the day when Noah entered the ark. And they were unaware until the flood came and swept them all away. So will, be, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. Then two men will be in the field, one will be taken and one will be left, Two women in the grinding mill, one will be taken and the other left. Therefore, stay awake, for you do not know on what day the, your Lord is coming. Can I stop there just for a second because I'm also running out of time. <laughs> Everybody says they want to be the ones that are taken. Here he's talking about the destruction of the flood. Those that are unprepared are taken. Those that are prepared are saved. You don't want to be taken and destroyed, you want to be saved through the ark, with Noah, with Yeshua, seeing us through the storms and the tempest of the days ahead. It goes on and on and on talking about that. Let me jump ahead to 1 Peter chapter 3. <clears throat> Look what it says. Because even Messiah once suffered for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous to bring you to God, having been put to death indeed in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit in which also he went and proclaimed unto the spirits in prison, watch this, who were disobedient at one time when the patience of Elohim, God, waited when? In the days of Noah. Spirits that are in prison and they got put in prison when? when God was patient during the days of Noah. He's not talking about humans. He's talking about disembodied spirits that were part of these hybrids. And these angels, these watchers, that committed this gross sin with human women. And he says, during the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is eight beings, were saved through the water, which figure now also saves us. Immersion or baptism, not a putting away of filth from the flesh, 
but the answer of a good conscience toward God through the resurrection of Yeshua the Messiah. Peter even understood this connection between Noah and Yeshua and salvation and how it's all connected back there in Genesis chapter 6. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 7. By belief, Noah, having been warned of what was yet unseen, having feared, prepared an ark to save his house, through which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness, which is according to belief, faith. Faith in God, hearing God, and responding when God speaks. Trusting in Him, even over what we see. <clears throat> I'm going to stop there. Uh, I'm going to tell you that you need to read Ezekiel 14. Probably just read the whole chapter. I could even just say, just read your Bible. Um, we're told in 2 Timothy... Um, you know, read Ezekiel 14, especially up through verse 23, um, <clears throat> where he talks about there's going to be some survivors, um, but you just trust in God. Galatians chapter 5 talks about what the works of the flesh are, and it's obvious. It's idolatry, uh, sensuality, impurity, sexual immorality, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions. Does that sound like America today? Second Timothy 3 says, but understand this, in the last days there will, there will come times of difficulty. Doesn't say that we're going to escape them. It says there, there's coming. For people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving God, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having the appearance of godliness but denying its power. Avoid such people. Paul telling young Timothy, this is what's going to happen in these latter days. Avoid such people. Is that true today? My goodness. It's that and more. <clears throat> Um, we are at the time in history when it's the days of Noah as far as the way people are acting. But connected to that is back to this story of the Nephilim and what all was going on. And people tainted with this evil, sorcery, demonic teaching of becoming a hybrid so that you can escape that God and become your own God. And Elohim, Yahovah, God, Yahovah says, I created everything. Now I didn't create these hybrids, but I created everything that created the hybrids, but I'm in control of time and space and that will never succeed. And I will make sure, and I'm gonna prove it to you. I'm gonna paint all these pictures over and over and over again in your Bible. I'm going to give you clues. And Paul understood this. He said the things that were written in the Old Testament were written for our instruction and that we should learn from that and that even the appointed times in the Bible uh, and all of that are shadow pictures of good things to come. But the substance and the goal of that stuff is the Messiah. Yeshua came and he's coming again and he's going to set all the accounts right. And the next time, the earth will be destroyed with fire. But before even that happens, Yeshua will come and he will open his mouth and he will speak and he will consume those that are enemies of his. Don't fall into the trap of everything that's going on out there and what they're trying to tell you. Don't fall for the trap that's coming that says that the God of the Bible is actually the liar but these gods that are coming are actually the ones that have been protecting us all this time. That's a lie out of the pit. Mark my words on that. That one's coming. Uh, don't fall for that. Listen to what your Bible says. Listen to what the Spirit is teaching you from the very Word of God, not from pastors and not even from me. Go read it for yourself, but I beg you, read it in context. Stop 
jerking and yanking verses and words out of context to help you feel better about what you already believe. Lay all that aside and say, I wanna know the truth, God, no matter what it is or how scary it might seem, I wanna know what the truth is so that I can follow you and be close to you so that when the storm comes, I'll be ready to get into the boat and I'll get in the boat and I'll wait and let you shut the door because you will see me safely home as he did Noah and his sons. And he said, once again, be fruitful and fill the earth. And that's what he's telling us to do. Fill the earth with his goodness and his light. Build the kingdom of God. God bless you. I hope this teaching has been a blessing to you. Uh, if it has, please give us, you know, that thumbs up. Make some comments there on YouTube. It really, it just helps. Uh, it might help some of your friends find it. Uh, share it with some people. I just, I hope it's been a blessing to you. I hope it's been a little challenging. Maybe you've learned some things that you didn't think about before. If you need some help, please contact us. Fourwindschurch.org. It's all spelled out. Let us know. We'd love to pray for you. Let get back in touch with you. Whatever we can do to help. God bless you. Let me pray over us. May Yahweh bless you and keep you. May he be gracious to you and cause his face to smile upon you. May he literally lift up his countenance upon you and give you his shalom. And through that process, watch this, place his name upon you. God bless you. Hope you're well and blessed. And I hope to see you soon.